Okay, I think we're gonna start. So welcome everyone and thanks to all the brave people that managed to come here the morning after the club night. Thanks for that. Uh, so today uh, we will have our symposium on multimodal imaging approaches to tackle brain excitability. There will be four talks, 12 minutes each. After each talk we will have uh, time for one to two urgent questions, but no worries, in the end we will have time to uh, have some more uh, questions in the bigger round. Yeah, thanks again also from my side. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Elisa Kalyoniemi from New Jersey Institute of Technology. She's an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering and she is also director of the Brain Simulation Lab there. And in her talk, she will explore how you can use, uh, how you can integrate TMS with EG and MEG in order to evaluate um, motor cortex excitability. Okay, thank you. My name is Elisa Kalliniemi, and uh, like uh, uh, Martin and Annalisa said, so I'm just going to kind of like a given uh, a focus on the kind of the most conventional way of looking at uh, brain excitability with TMS, which is to combine it with uh, TMS EEG and EMG. So before starting, I do have a, a disclosure to make. So I, I'm, I work as a consultant for Nextim Inc. Okay, so looking at cortical excitability we, uh, on the primary motor cortex. So the simplest way is always uh, combining TMS with electroamyography, so EMG. And how that works is that, uh, uh, once again, I have to find them. Okay, so how that works is that uh, you would give some TMS pulses, uh, you would map the cortical representation area for that muscle. Then you would give TMS pulses with a few seconds interval and uh, with a high enough intensity, and if, you're, if the target muscle uh, uh, is relaxed like this, uh, you will evoke a motor evoke, evoke potential, MEP. Uh, if the target muscle is voluntarily contracted, uh, you would evoke a motor evoke potential uh, followed by a silent period. Uh, and considering um, excitability, so uh, there's indications that the MEP reflects the, the function of the excitatory glutamatic system, uh, whereas the silent period is more associated with the inhibitory GABAergic system. So uh, if you would be using these measures to study motocortical uh, excitability, so basically the higher the excitability, the higher the MEP amplitude. Uh, similarly with the silent period, the longer the silent period uh, duration. Uh, in TMS field, uh, typically you um, always, so cortical excitability varies for all individuals. So everybody has a different cortical excitability. So typically at the beginning of a TMS experiment, we always cal uh, estimate this measure called motor threshold. Uh, and that's uh, estimated with uh, motor evoked potential. So basically it's just estimating the smallest TMS intensity that um, uh, is required to uh, evoke motor evoked potentials for that participant. Uh, obviously, with TMS EMG, it's it's quite limited because, uh, um, like, a, it's it's just like a up and down. Like, we're just basically looking at uh, amplitudes. Uh, there's an alternative way of looking at uh, cortical excitability, which is TMS EEG. Uh, obviously, TMS EEG is not limited to the motor cortex uh, per se, so you can study other areas as well. And, and then that allows uh, other possibilities, such as looking at functional connectivity and dynamics and things like that. Uh, so here I'm showing um, kind of like a basic response. So this is from the left uh, primary motor cortex hand area. So if you would give TMS pulses with a sufficient uh, intensity to the left uh, primary motor cortex uh, hand area, you would get something like this. Uh, so every time uh, TMS evokes this kind of a response with uh, both positive and negative uh, peaks uh, that last in total about uh, three, uh, 300 milliseconds. And then uh, there are some uh, pharmaceutical studies showing that uh, some of these peaks could reflect the activity of the glutamatergic, so the excitatory system, uh, and some uh, peaks would reflect the GABA-ergic system and some GABA-bergic system. 
Uh, and uh, of note considering this presentation is that you can actually evoke, so when we're looking at cortical excitability, there's type, uh, kind of like different levels. So you can actually evoke uh, TMS uh, EEG activity with a lot lower intensities compared to MEPs. So MEPs, you need higher intensities. Um, and then, so, so far most, uh, like a TMS EEG is like a still, I, I, I would say like up and coming uh, method. So there's, um, even though there's obviously a lot of researchers, but mostly, most of the brain areas are still, like we haven't studied them. However, from the, the areas that we have studied, uh, currently there's indications that one of these responses, though, so the N100, uh, would be kind of like the universal uh, TMS response. So whatever you're stimulating, uh, you would get that. Okay, so that brings me to the, um, uh, that introduction brings me to the topic of uh, my presentation today. So, so or the study uh, that I'm showing. Um, so as I mentioned, so uh, from the motor cortex, um, basically so far all of our knowledge uh, is from the hand area. However, as you can see, and obviously you know as well, so that motor area is not just hand. Uh, so we have the motor homunculus uh, that extends from the vertex to lateral parts, uh, and it has been divided into uh, functional areas for different body parts and muscles. Uh, and in the motor cortex, we actually even have, um, there's two different tracts, so cortical spinal tracts, so some of the muscles, uh, they're connected to the, uh, like some of the uh, cortical areas are connected to the muscles through a spinal tract, and some are not, so the cortical uh, pulpar tract uh, goes directly to the muscles. Uh, so in our study, we basically, because all the knowledge so far is from the hand area, uh, like in this study, it was, uh, the idea was very simple. Like what happens if we look at a cortical excitability with TMS EEG and TMS EMG across the motor homunculus? And to do that, uh, we measured uh, um, cortical excitability from the leg area, uh, the hand area, and the face area. Uh, and in this study, we had uh, 18 healthy volunteers, so 11 females, uh, 7 males. And uh, TMS EEG responses and TMS EMG responses were measured from uh, tibialis anterior muscle from the leg, uh, first dorsal interosseous muscle from the hand, uh, and mentalis muscle from the face and in random order. Uh, and for all muscles, uh, we first did a motor mapping, so localize the area. Uh, of, of, of the, like the cortical representation area. Uh, then we estimated the resting motor threshold for that muscle. So again, the smallest inten uh, TMS intensity needed to activate that muscle. Uh, then we evoked 150 TMS pulses at 90% of the resting motor threshold while measuring re EEG. So basically the goal was we wanted to have EEG without the uh, MEPs, because uh, that would influence what the, um, the EEG responses would look like. And then we did some group level analysis in both uh, time domain and uh, time frequency domain. Okay, so uh, uh, here are the results uh, considering the motor threshold. So again, motor threshold is the, the typical uh, cortical excitability measure measured with EMG. So for the leg area, uh, the uh, the uh, motor threshold was 66% of the maximum stimulator output, for the hand, uh, 44%, and for face, 57%. So hand area, uh, when measuring like uh, this method, was most excitable, and that was uh, evident also from the statistical testing. Then looking at TMS EEG responses in time domain first. So here on the left, uh, I'm presenting uh, so here's um, potentials recorded uh, from the left primary motor cortex. So this was a region of interest that covered all the electrodes uh, that we were evaluating, or like wh which were uh, targeted. And then on the right, uh, there's uh, responses on CZ electrodes. So that's kind of like outside area uh, on the vertex. Um, so if we look at the primary motor cortex responses first, uh, so at the beginning, the responses seem very similar, but however, like, already after 50 milliseconds, uh, they start to differ. So uh, uh, so if we look at the, the hand area first, the hand area shows the typical 
uh, uh, like the waveform that that we expected. Uh, then if we look at the leg area, it actually it's very much more simpler. So, and also for leg area, there's a response or negative peak already at 50 milliseconds, but there's nothing around 100 milliseconds, which is, uh, which were, uh, we are actually uh, surprised. And then after that, uh, there's very um, few peaks. Uh, for face area, it's basically dominated by two different uh, massive peaks. So there's a um, positive peak and a very long, um, uh, in, like a negative peak. Again, we're not sure whether these are all in hundreds. It could be or it could be not. Uh, the same for CZ electrode. Um, at the beginning, they were very similar, but after about 50 milliseconds, the responses started to differ and the biggest differences were between 100 and 150 milliseconds. So obviously here, because uh, this is um, outside the motor cortex, so the responses had already spread uh, from their original location. So then uh, looking at this uh, same uh, potentials uh, slightly differently, so with a measure called uh, global field power, uh, so that's uh, basically spatial standard deviation of the signal, and it includes all EEG electrodes. So previously I just showed uh, potentials from specific areas, uh, but global field power includes all areas, uh, all electrodes, sorry. So it's basically like a global uh, excitability measure. And as you can see, uh, so the face area had the, the largest excitability. Uh, then the leg uh, and then the, the face. So even though motor thresholds uh, for hand was most excitable, but with these measures, uh, it was not. Um, then uh, let's look at uh, topography. So as I mentioned, uh, once you give a TMS pulse, the responses will spread around about 300 milliseconds. So here we just looked at uh, how is the activity looking at uh, specific time points um, through that uh, spreading. Uh, and the time points have been selected uh, the, um, from here. So basically when we were expecting a peak. Um, so this could be uh, like a kind of like effective uh, connectivity, but also like how specific areas are kind of like, a, like a co connected, but also showing cortical excitability in a way, but through connectivity. So initially the responses look very similar. Uh, uh, up until uh, 130 milliseconds. And from there on, basically the phase uh, area responses, they show very uh, frontal, uh, uh, pat, uh, pat, like um, they're, they're very frontally located, whereas for leg and hand, the responses keep uh, staying on uh, centrally. Uh, then finally looking at uh, what happens in the time frequency domain. So here on the left, uh, I'm showing uh, alpha frequency band and on the right, uh, beta frequency band. And the, the pictures, uh, are like figures above, so these are event-related spectral perturbations. So those show increased uh, or decreased synchronizations and uh, below here, integral coherence. So basically how, uh, how uh, coherent the phase is across uh, the trials. So looking at both uh, alpha and beta frequency, uh, at the beginning, the, they, the muscles do differ from each other, but after that, uh, basically the, the synchronization is very uh, similar. There's no statistical differences. Uh, also in the phase, uh, there are they, um, no, no differences. So these uh, behave, uh, the muscles behave very similarly. Um, then finally looking at gamma band, um, on the gamma band, we see kind of similar in the uh, synchronization. So again, at the beginning, right after the TMS pulse, we see differences. Um, but after that, uh, nothing really. However, uh, here on the gamma band, we surprisingly see some uh, differences in the faces. So to, to kind of summarize, um, um, even though we've been using TMS ET responses ma mainly on the hand area, uh, but across the motor homunculus, like the, the responses do differ by looking at almost any measure. So in amplitude, uh, there might be different peaks. Uh, they, they, they differ in cortical excitability as well as on the frequency bands. Okay, so before wrapping up, I just want to advertise. Uh, uh, so if anybody still doesn't have anything to do in the end of July, beginning of August, so we're organizing a New York Neuromodulation Conference in New York. So uh, it would be nice to see all of you there. Uh, and thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Elisa. This was a super nice talk. Are there any uh, immediate questions? Yes? Yes, uh, very interesting um, talk. I wonder whether any of the variation in, in the TEP could be due to um, different neighbors of the, of the cortex. So with the leg area, you're closer to medial wall motor areas um, as opposed to, say, um, dorsal and ventral prefrontal areas for the other. And secondarily, face stimulation often gives more muscle activation. So um, was there any control for the, the sort of nonspecific, non-cortical effects of the different stimulation locations? Okay, yeah, good question. So yeah, absolutely, like uh, location and obviously uh, connectivity for sure should matter. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, for this, uh, we try to control the, the muscle contractions in a way that like uh, the stimulation was given at 90% of the resting motor threshold. And even though we were focusing on EEG, we did measure EMG at the same time. So we did see if there were any uh, uh, potentials, but however, we didn't actually see with these intensities in the face muscles. So typically in the uh, face muscles, that's actually something that I didn't mention. So when we're looking at uh, resting motor threshold, uh, uh, I mean, with, uh, with face muscles, um, the, the MEPs are very small. It's very hard to evoke a large MEPs in the, the face muscles. But yeah, definitely these uh, impacts. So, so this study was, um, the idea of this study was just to characterize, and then now we're looking at more into detail, like where are the differences coming? So that would hopefully be uh, 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 something I could present maybe next year. Okay, thank you. There's one more question from the app, and that is what pre-processing pipeline was used to clean the data from the muscular uh, artifacts since ICA has been shown to be unreliable? Is it ICA unreliable? Uh, uh, that, that was part of the question, yeah. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, so artifacts were removed uh, with ICA uh, in this study, for sure. Um, I do understand. Yeah, I mean, uh, so ICA is kind of like, um, I guess, controversy. So uh, it's objective, like who is doing the analysis, because uh, whoever is doing the analysis has to make, make the decision, is this an artifact or not? Uh, and that's obviously a tricky thing. Uh, unfortunately, like currently in the field, we don't have perfect methods to remove artifacts. Um, so um, we did, uh, when we were doing, doing the artifact removal, we did compare uh, pre-post uh, artifact removals and try to make uh, kind of like a, make sure that we didn't remove too much uh, or anything like that. Great, so thanks again, Elisa. Yeah, thank you.